We turn our attention now to what is really a complication of a sexually transmitted infection, and that is pelvic inflammatory disease. We would define it as a sexually transmitted infection which leads to a clinical syndrome of inflammation from the cervix to the endometrium and involving the fallopian tubes and the contiguous pelvic structures. It can be quite a serious process. And the numbers are pretty serious as well. A million women in the United States each year present with pelvic inflammatory disease. We call it PID. You can expect it in about 40% of women who develop endocervicitis and get no treatment, whether it's due to Neisseria gonorrhea or chlamydia trachomatis. The women who are likely to get PID are often teenagers, three times more than women of the age 25 to 29, women who have multiple sexual partners, someone with a new sexual partner within the previous 30 days, or frequent sexual intercourse with a single partner. These are also risky types of behavior for pelvic inflammatory disease. There are some other associations, some of which we don't clearly understand. And one of these is bacterial vaginosis. Women with this process are more prone to developing PID. For reasons that are probably a little more obvious, a woman who has an intrauterine device is more likely to have organisms track up the genital tract. Women who douche a lot also may be subject to pelvic inflammatory disease. And the process seems to occur during menses. It's fascinating that women who smoke cigarettes have an increased incidence of pelvic inflammatory disease in virtually all studies. The mechanism is not uh, very clear. Uh, some speculate that the cigarette smoke makes the cilia of the fallopian tubes dysfunctional, perhaps allowing organisms to move up the fallopian tubes. And there is an association that's not well explained with substance abuse and PID. So the causes of pelvic inflammatory disease are these notorious pathogens again, Neisseria gonorrhea, chlamydia trachomatis, and a wide variety of other bugs as well. And these include anaerobic bacteria, and it should be pointed out that in human beings, life on man and woman is anaerobic. Anaerobes actually outnumber aerobes, uh, for example, in the colon by a thousand to one. Aerobic gram-negative rods, other colonic type organisms, streptococci, and mycoplasma can be involved. So very often when you have infection that's pelvic inflammatory disease, you actually have mixed organisms on a gram-stained smear. So a little bit about the pathogenesis. We have direct canalicular spread of organisms from the endocervix to the endometrial mucosa and to the fallopian tubes. And this is not proven, but it is speculated that sexually transmitted organisms like Neisseria gonorrhea cause this inflammation of the tubal mucosa and they facilitate other organisms, say from the GI tract, moving up into the female genital tract. But as I mentioned, the mechanisms are rather poorly understood. But unfortunately, pelvic inflammatory disease comes with some long-term sequelae, like scarring. And when the fallopian tubes are scarred, 
things like ectopic pregnancy can develop. So what are the clinical features of pelvic inflammatory disease? By and large, you're talking about a clinical diagnosis. And we physicians are rather imprecise in how we make this diagnosis. Our positive predictive value is between 65 and 90 percent compared with the gold standard of laparoscopy. And furthermore, many episodes go undiagnosed because the women have, the, have PID, but they don't have symptoms or their symptoms are rather mild. So the bottom line is a good physician should have his or her antenna up because the diagnosis may be very, very subtle. And as a result, we often need to use empirical treatment. So the classic clinical picture would be a woman who has abdominal pain, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant, or bilateral lower abdominal pain. And all patients who present like that to an emergency department should have a pelvic examination. And on a pelvic exam, one, the classic finding would be cervical motion tenderness. With the least motion of the cervix, this often produces excruciating pain uh, in the woman being examined. And it would be prudent for the physician doing the pelvic exam to warn the woman that he's going to, he or she is going to move the cervix and it's important for the woman to mention whether this is very painful or not. The other thing that you might expect would be white blood cells in vaginal secretions. And if a woman has no white cells in vaginal secretions, no cervical discharge, she probably doesn't have PID. However, bacterial vaginosis is a marker mucopurulent cervicitis, and certainly a test for Neisseria gonorrhea or chlamydia trachomatis is an indication for empirical treatment. Most of the patients have a temperature that is greater than 38 degrees Celsius, but some patients are afebrile. Uh, some ancillary tests that we often use would be testing for an elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or SED rate, or C-reactive protein. All of these are indications for empirical treatment for PID. When the diagnosis still remains in doubt, or if our empirical regimen, whatever we've chosen, hasn't seemed to work, then that may be an indication for a laparoscopy. And so generally that's for failure of empirical therapy or patients who have a history of PID and negative tests for gonorrhea, chlamydia, or bacterial vaginosis. Those are the ones that probably do need a laparoscopy. Besides this, the laparoscopy is also used to detect Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome when it finds parahepatitis. So then, how do we treat PID? Well, fortunately, we have regimens to treat most patients as an outpatient. We would hospitalize patients only for clinically severe disease, high fever, nausea, vomiting, or patients unable to tolerate or follow an outpatient oral regimen. And that includes you know, a sizable minority of individuals. We would certainly, for the safety of mother and baby, hospitalize all pregnant women with PID. And one of the major concerns is, is there pus that needs to be drained, a tube ovarian abscess? So they would need to be admitted because antibiotics will fail to resolve a big abscess. The antibiotics don't penetrate well 
and the abscess needs, as we say in medicine, fresh air and sunshine. It needs drainage. And then sometimes acute appendicitis is in the differential diagnosis. And when a physician can't exclude appendicitis, it would be prudent to admit the patient. Pelvic rest is another form of therapy. It's very, very important to resolve this process. And so in terms of treating patients with antibiotics, for outpatients, we use a combination of intramuscular and oral regimens. And the classic regimen is that of ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams in a single dose. And as you remember, this is a treatment for gonorrhea. We also add doxycycline twice a day for 14 days, and this will cover our chlamydia and mycoplasma organisms if they're present. We also add metronidazole. Now, metronidazole will, is a wonderful agent to treat anaerobic organisms, which may be involved in this infection, as I mentioned. And also, it is a treatment for bacterial vaginosis that might be present. Another regimen would be that that's commonly used would be that of cefoxetin plus probenicid to keep the levels of cefoxetin high, plus doxycycline plus metronidazole. Now for inpatients, we're gonna be using essentially IV cefoxetin every 12 hours or every six hours plus doxycycline every 12 hours, or clindamycin plus genomycin, which will cover the aerobic gram-negative rods and the anaerobes, and some alternative parenteral regimen. One choice, for example, would be ampicillin sulbactam, which is a beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor, uh, which covers anaerobes very, very well and then the doxycycline. So we would expect patients to improve within three days. If there's no improvement after our outpatient intramuscular oral therapy, we would then hospitalize and reassess our antibiotic regimen and consider diagnostic laparoscopy. We would also repeat the tests for Neisseria gonorrhea and chlamydia trachomatis. And then three months after treatment, we would retest again. So we would expect clinical improvement within three days. Another important thing would be to counsel our patients about the problems and complications of pelvic inflammatory disease. And we would have to honestly tell the patients there is an increased incidence of ectopic pregnancy because of the scarring of the fallopian tubes and the adhesions that develop as part of this process. So in terms of preventing further episodes of PID, we'd recommend that a person who's been exposed to a woman with PID during 60 days before the onset of symptoms should be tested for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Now for a woman whose last sexual intercourse was more than 60 days, we would recommend that we treat the most recent sex partner for both gonorrhea and chlamydia empirically. We would also recommend abstinence from sex until a therapy has been completed and the symptoms have resolved completely for both woman and for her partner. And this brings us to our conclusion of the discussion of pelvic inflammatory disease.